I'm Liz Steininger. Uh, I don't know how to change slides. That's great. There we go. Okay. So I work for a company called Least Authority. Um, our sibling company is Zcash. Least Authority was started by a guy named Zuko who also started Zcash. We work with Tahoe Laughs and with Magic Wormhole. And some of you might know me from previously working at the Open Technology Fund. So that's the quick introduction. But um, I want to talk to you guys about um, for-profit companies within both the security space and also um, in the open source world and how for-profit companies can help us to Im help us to achieve our missions that we have within the space and um, yeah so I think that it's uh, yeah sorry there we go okay so I live in Berlin <laughs> and I see graffiti like this every day um, I'm not going to do a presentation on it, but I love seeing it. I think it is really great to see how this kind of, this that you can see how um, it illustrates missions that people have. Like it's a way of communication that um, there's all kinds of ways that we can, um, that we can use art, that we can use different things in the world to, um, yeah, to, to get our different missions. And I think most people at this camp have some sort of belief um, that that how society should be different and better and that I think that it's really easy for us to just complain about other larger corporations and how they're not doing things right and it's still good for us to put pressure on them to change things but that we should also start companies ourselves to help further the, the missions that we have within the space. So if we believe that everybody should have um, the right to privacy, then perhaps we should build companies that have give people the right to privacy in their tools. Um, so, you know, I'll just, I don't know if the slides are helping much. I might go off of them. So how many of you are interested in starting a business? Oh, wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> and um, how many of you feel like that's more difficult because of your what your beliefs are? Or do you feel like you're, okay, a little bit, you feel like your beliefs can maybe enhance what you do with a company? Okay, so what's stopping you from starting a company? Okay. <laughs> Those of you who want to, why haven't you? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, what? Oh, he said um, he just started a company. Uh, no, you just left your you left your current company, and you're in the process of starting one. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things that I find you want to start one too. Yeah. Yeah. That's there's definitely a difficulty with like the transition of. Um, of that, and I'm not sure that that's any easier in any other industry. I think it might be just one of those things, but I do think that our space could, um, we could talk about ways that we could make that transition easier for people. Um, I know that, you know, it's there's a lot of funding of tech here, and but maybe not so much of setting up the organizations to support that tech and the sustainability over the long run. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I'm not a really good speaker, <laughs> but I'm, I don't know. So uh, what else did you all hope to, to get out of this? So you, a lot of people want to start companies and you're finding some challenges, but do you also feel like you wish there were more companies that you could be a customer of um, that supported the things that you believe in? Some shakes. Do I want to? There you go. If you're going to uh, think about a company, then No? Oh. Yeah. 
Um, <coughs> I mean, what is the basic question? If if you're funding a company, um, normally it has some commercial background, and there are a lot of companies which have good visions, good ideas, um, maybe a good basic principles, however you call it. Yeah. And then maybe one day you came to the point um, where you have to decide um, how can I still follow these principles? Yeah. Or do I have to go with the market? Or, for example, do I have to take uh, contracts from the web industry or whatever you want to do? For example, if you take Facebook. Yep. <laughs> all these guys. They all yeah. have missions. All these. Uh, I found the nicest. In something. Yeah. It's Google who, who says we are the good, no? And, or we are the, the brave. And, uh, yeah. You can think about that, no? Yeah. And um, now my question to the talk is here, what are you pointing to? No? And I read about uh, that there are some people who say we want to make Google some kind of other uh, kind of organization um, to make it more open, to make it more stable, to um, open the um, search engine for everyone and to get a better control of it. And I think this is quite a sustainable attempt. But um, the question is, can you do it with a financial driven company which has to um, work on an open market which follow yeah. capitalistic rules no? yeah I think I mean that's it's it's a good point that it that sometimes it seems like the missions the things that we believe in are at odds with um, capitalism and profits um, but I do think that if we work hard to be creative about business models and figuring out um, looking at some good examples and, and just talking amongst ourselves at, at, at sessions like this uh, we can find ways to not totally fall to it and I and I think it also um, I'll keep going through the slides but it also comes down to are you doing the business for just profit or are you doing the business because of, of what your beliefs are and if you're doing the business for profit then yeah you're gonna your mission is gonna get put to the wayside if you're doing it for something else then the profit is just a tool it's just a way to get there and um, it, yeah there's things to consider to make sure that you don't get corrupted by that along the way um, but yeah it's it's really interesting all these companies do have these these missions that they, they have things that they believe in they're not doing it just to make money and yet um, yeah, we're not happy with them, but <laughs> but we. But I think it's important for us to put pressure on these types of companies. But I think it's also important for us to start our own, to um, to push things the where to we would believe in. And so you know, what's good here is that we all use technology, and technology is a really really powerful tool to change society. So if we do believe that certain people should have rights to things, then. You know, we, if we build it in technology, you're making a face. <laughs> but if we build it in technology, then um, then we can, we if we build the technology with those with those things in mind, then we can really help to shape society to be something more that that we that we want it to be. Um, all that to say that just technology is not neutral. That technology does have an impact on how we how we live. In fact, I caught some of Jillian from EFF's talk, and she was talking about um, the digital colonization of, you know, the social networks and how they put forth um, American ideals to other countries uh, in their social world. And I and I, it's great criticism. And but we should, we should also do that ourselves if we want to push out our beliefs. Then we can just play the same game they play. Um, anyway, technology is the product and the tool. And so these are just, this is just a good list of um, different ways that technology can change what we're working on. Um, every, we all probably work on projects that are related to something on this list. And we do it because we have a purpose in mind that we're trying to do something better than what's out there right now. And this is the, the for-profit part that... Um, that when we think about profit, uh, we always think about the bad things like corporate surveillance and ad-driven business models and um, lucrative zero days and stuff like that. But um, it, yeah, for-profit is something that it's just we need to think of it more of a structure instead of the actual, the actual goal. So profits do not need to equal success for a for-profit business that um, we can redefine 
I mean, it matters how we define success in the in the sense of uh, in the sense of a for-profit company. So, again, like I said, profits are not the goal. That profits are just the incentive to to build to build what we want and to to change to change the technology and the world. So, I think it's important that we apply our missions to our business models and that when we are thinking about how we're going to make money off of technology or how we're going to have that for-profit business operate and pay for itself to even just be sustainable at the minimum, then we should be thinking about um, what are we incentivizing with our business models. And so like in the ad-driven business, we're incentivizing the collecting of personal, personal data from people. And that if we don't agree with that, then we shouldn't incentivize it with money. So um, I think we need to just start more discussions about what other kinds of models that there are. And so this is just some questions, some things that I think about are like, yeah, what are you trying to incentivize? Are you trying to incentivize people to share their data for you to collect? Or are you trying to incentivize people to do something different? And um, what, what is fair for people to be paying for and what is, like what's acceptable for them to pay for. And this is especially important within the open source, the free and open source world because um, yeah, to some degree you're not expecting them to pay for the software, so what are they paying for instead? Are they paying for the service? Are they paying for tra training additives to it? Um, and then what should be free and who should have that freedom? And I think that that's another thing that comes back to the mission of, you know, what are you really trying to achieve with what you believe in? Um, so what do you want to give away? What do people deserve to have without pain? And what does that cost you to do that? And that, that comes back to like calculating that out, figuring out that, yeah. <laughs> I think it depends, well, it depends on the tech project that you're working on. So, um, and a lot of people do free and open software here, so a lot of times in the, the free the, so, the free part is the software, right? So, um, yeah, that answers that question. <laughs> or did you have a specific project in mind? My question is, uh, people are already expecting free services. Free services. Oh, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, so you, the, the reference to the companies that provide things like social networks for free and email for free and all these things for free. And that's definitely, yeah. It's not necessarily that people expect services for free, but sometimes you just can get them for free. For example, I would love to use Google services, and they make roughly like $20 of my data. I, I'm willing to give them like 30 like they make a $10 profit, but they just don't offer the service. So it's also like how the whole system is set up. But yeah, this give people the option to pay. This is, and it's also, I mean, we have to remind ourselves that this is learned, that people learned that they should have these things for free, um, and that we can, teach them that we can help to educate them that you are paying for it in a different way and and here's something different that you can pay for and and I think that yeah we just had building those values in and telling people about what we value like so if you value that privacy so yeah um the uh, the, uh, there are also companies that do believe that uh, something should should be free. I once worked um, one year for a startup that that had, that made um, a, a Firefox uh, uh, plugin and and and, um, and a corresponding backend. Of, or, uh, that well, the, the the goal was to uh, allow children uh, uh, to go on the web in a in a safe way, uh, curated by their own parents rather than some an anonymous uh, editors. Uh, um, uh, who might have completely different values. For example, well, with 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 um, um, uh, 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 with the other talk, uh, in it, uh, some people think um, um, uh, 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 violence, viol uh, seeing violence is okay and sex is bad, and uh, other parents might have the exact opposite idea. Yeah. Well, so so the the, the philosophy of that company was um, uh, that 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 parents should be keeping an eye on their own kids' uh, internet use instead of you know uh, outsourcing it to some company. 
And they and, and, probably and, and, figured out a different way to make money, and right? No, they did not. Oh. <laughs> they, they unfortunately went bankrupt. They, they had, they, it, 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 was, it was a really nice idea, and, and they wanted, they, they felt that it should be something that should be free. Yeah. Um, so they need, to, uh, need to, to, to figure out another way to make money. So they put focus on some vague family-oriented uh, social network thing that completely failed and they went bankrupt. So it's yeah, just uh, I mean, even free, if you free can, can free can be a risk if you if you don't ha haven't really thought about your business model. Definitely, yeah, and uh, I guess it, it's that's that's where it's a trade-off. Sometimes maybe it's easier to take the the routes of collecting people's data and making money off of ads or something than it is to go the route of you know doing something you believe in um, that giving people things for free. But I do think that with some good thought about like these types of questions and, and just good thought about like what other value does that technology hold, that you can find other ways to, to make money off of these types of things. And, and maybe the, like it's, it's interesting, sometimes the customer that will pay isn't necessarily your person that you're looking to benefit from, from the product. Sometimes, um, there's other interested parties that are willing to pay, and then it becomes a, like an indirect benefit that people get something for free, that you want them to have for free. Um, yeah, and and that's, yeah, so sometimes your, your customers are just not obvious that um, because of the mission, it's really easy for us to get focused on you know, this is what I want to achieve, and maybe miss out that there's a wind, there's a side path or, or some sort of winding path where there's other customers that we weren't targeting that actually are willing to pay, and then we can still give away something else for free. <laughs> um, but to to give some examples is like consulting, training, support services, um, subscription services again, and just looking creatively about who. Who would want this? Or could this technology be applied to somebody else that is willing and able and should pay? Um, yeah, so, and I think um, that goes into the last question of like, to what are your risks for cor corruption? And um, are, your, are your incentives um, gonna like expose you to other risks and stuff? So, um, yeah, cute bear. <laughs> uh, this is uh, so. For I'll talk. I'll talk a little bit about what I do with least authority. But um, yeah, we believe that privacy is a human right, and that security should be easy to use and accessible to everybody. And we think that um, while we do have competition with like free services and things, that that we can work to educate people that privacy is important and worth paying for. Um, but we do free and open software, and we would ask we ask people to pay for the service of convenience, so that we can still stick with that belief that people can have that people could do this on their own if they wanted to, um, and that's just us. And this is the polar bear. This stands for the principle of least authority. So it's 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 just a fun way of us trying to like reach more people that privacy and security doesn't always have to be scary and serious, that. Um, that starting to learn um, about the va educating people about the value of, um, of of privacy online. Oh, did I skip the bear? Anyway, <laughs> so to talk more about sustainability. Um, I think that it's really important for us to sell, like figure out these questions for the tech projects in our space um, because of the long-term sustainability and um, because people people need to live. Um, when you're thinking about your project, you should think about the business life cycle that it has. So um, at what point are you at? What point do you want to be at? What are your goals at those different stages and the incentives that you need to get through that? And. I want to just, I think it's really easy for us to say it's hard, so we shouldn't try to tackle it, but it's important to also remember that this is like not being, not building sustainable companies within, with our beliefs is going to, um, it just, there's, there's negative consequences to it. So there, there's ethical implications of um, this technology not being sustainable. We have a responsibility to the people who are using anything that we put out there is f that's free and open. That we have, um, we have, 
a responsibility to people who are contributing to it. And um, I mean, it's great the way that the culture has evolved that people ha don't don't feel, um, I don't know, that, 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 that so the culture is, is great, but we still need to realize that there's um, implications to, you know, maybe code not being updated, but still being used by people. Um, and that how we're handling personal data and things like that. And I also do think that by having more sustainable businesses within this community, we can also increase diversity in the field because um, it's difficult to make a living. And some people, and, and it's, I think it's important for us to give a, a variety of options for how people can employ and make a living in the, in the field. And if we're only looking at like project-based stuff or you know the grant funding or something like that, then we're really cutting out a good population that could be contributing to these things, the things that they believe in. We should give them companies that they can go work for. So um, this, is, this is where I'm just wrapping up the slides part and we can keep talking, but I just wonder if we can make the majority of the world see the same thing that we all see here. So we come together at this camp and we believe, you know, when we talk about things that we all shared interests and everything, but can we help the rest of the world understand this world? Um, I think our missions can bring us together in a way that, that, that money can't, and that gives us, um, but we can use that structure of a for-profit company to have a greater impact on the world, to, to see through things. And I would just encourage you all to um, go beyond just criticizing the current companies that exist, but also build companies that do fit your ideals or join a company that does fit your ideals. And um, yeah, think creatively about the projects you work on and how we can make them more sustainable. So yeah, just more Berlin graffiti, because it's fun. <laughs> Um, yeah, so do you guys want to ch chat more? You have a question? Um, so for you, what, is, what would be the key advantages of, of fund, um, founding a for-profit um, corporation instead of a non-profit one? Um, yeah, why why are you talking about that, not about non-profit uh, corporation? Yeah, I'm talking about for-profit because that's that's where that's where my head's at right now is like hacking the business world and trying to figure out how we can make the business world like just changing it from the inside, I guess, because it's just it was really easy for me to complain about it from the outside, <laughs> and it's like well, and also to see um, how can I. I'm interested too to make projects more sustainable and how can I fund everybody doing this good work and you know you know find uh, I think that the, also the work that is done by the projects here should be available to everybody and they're not and that's not right but um, as to why a nonprofit or for profit would be better I think it depends on the project and it depends on like what your mission is and if you think that um, yeah, it just, it, I think the answer is it depends to the answers to that questions, those questions before, and thinking about like what you're trying to incentivize. Um, yeah, and sometimes a, a nonprofit is the right answer. I'm definitely not advocating for everybody to do for profit companies. I'm just trying to get us over um, realizing that nonprofit isn't the only way to go, and that uh, it's, it's okay. To, to do for-profit companies and not focus on the profit. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always hesitant about that because um, what I like is, is having a body that is somehow democratically governed and somehow yeah. um, you know, formally uh, constrained to, to a certain set of actions it could take, which I would see in, in the non-profit sector, but not so much in the for-profit sector. Um, but just because you don't see it there doesn't mean that it can't be done, right? Okay, so uh. <laughs> <laughs> that that maybe yeah maybe there's lots of bad examples in the for-profit world, but that's not a reason for us to not do for-profit companies. That again, it's like even the name of for-profit is not quite right because you can it's just a, it's just a structure of an organization that helps you achieve goals, right? It's a collection of people trying to do something, and and profit is just a tool along the way to keep them going. So, so actually, what would be your definition of for-profit or non-profit? So where would be the dividing line? Well, I know that it, legally it changes in different jurisdictions that there's different categories of these things, but I guess what I'm saying is that even in the for-profit world and the for-profit business structures that, that you can still have some of those values be true. You could set up a company where things are, are more democratically run, there's, and, and maybe you should. I don't know. 
Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I guess there's not an easy answer to that one. Yeah, I think what you mean is a profitable organization with a good intention yeah. in mind. Mission-driven is what some people say, yeah. Mission-driven company. But that's not very specific, isn't it? I know, it's not. And, and like I showed those like Google and Facebook and stuff, they all have, they all have missions too. So uh, they have missions that they really greatly believe in and they're doing good, and yet we criticize yeah. them for what they're doing. In, so, um, and, and to open up the discussion a little bit, I think in the technology sector at the moment, um, the problem is that what was passed, a good profit in the past was maybe 3 to 5% for American companies was 10 to 15%. Now a good profit is some hundred percent or even thousand percent. And uh, if you have a normal company like IBM, they make even 67%. And that's, if you compare it to, for example, classic German values, uh, where the Deutsche Bank says, a uh, good profitable organization, we are the best profitable organization in Germany, because we have 24% on yeah. our uh, foreign money, no? which is invested. I think and the problem there is that this um, profit rate drives the company into a very, uh, I would say it's like a tunnel. No? So mm -hmm. you cannot do any more mistakes and you have to work with less people for most, uh, to get the most profit out. And um, there is a Günther Dück, uh, he wrote a column, or uh, newspaper articles, and he said, now the companies are like, uh, like a gyros. No? Uh, you cut away every piece which is going to be black, and there's nothing left behind, because you want to reach the maximum of the profit out of it, or you want to get the most profit out of it. And that makes it problematic if you come with your sustainable ideas and mm -hmm. you say there must be a, some, we have to make good things and for example I work in a company and I say we have to do a, we have customers the customers have problems we have to solve them and they will pay us for that but even that we cannot deliver anymore because our profit rate is so high that we have to reduce services for example for the customers and the customer they lay in front of us and they say, please offer us the services because we cannot do it ourselves and no one else can do it than you. And we say, no, we don't have enough people, we cannot employ anymore and the whole model is not profitable anymore for whatever reasons because we are, um, our stocks are dealt now in a free market. Yeah. And, um, and, and out of this uh, constellation resulting a lot of problems. And therefore, I thought when you started the talk, all you would intend is better to do with a non-profit organization or some government-driven organization. But then the later question is, um, you're going to ask questions like, um, you want to bring back altruism or communism or things like that. They were not so bad in a lot of uh, things. Yeah, I mean, to, to your point about for-profit companies having to constantly increase their profits and it being competitive, I think it comes back to, it, my answer to that would be like, for who are they serving? And in the cases of the examples that you gave, they're serving, they're, they're publicly traded companies, right? So, um, they're, so they're, they have to serve their, state, their shareholders to make them profits. But that's not the only way to structure a company. You don't have to, have, you don't have to do an IPO if you don't want to. <laughs> I mean, especially smaller to, small to medium-sized tech companies, that's not something that they need to be concerned about. They, uh, yeah. Yeah. That is right, what you're saying. No? Also, um, if you do not do, an, if you don't go to the real open market, or if you don't go to the stock market, then you have some benefits, or you can work in a different way, which yeah. do a lot of family companies in Germany, for example. Yeah. But they have to live with a much less profit than other companies. And um, if you're going to the big ones, maybe that Facebook, Apple, and all these companies are, are the big ones. Well, no discussion about that. Um, then the rules are slightly different than what well, if you're having your own small company but where you cover everything. The rules are also very different depending on how you build your company, who invests in it. If you invest just your own time and you're the complete owner of the company, then you can do whatever you want with your profits. Your profits can be 0%. You can just reinvest them all back into the company and do great if it's just you. Um, so yeah, I guess it depends on how you structure it and how you scale and stuff. And so I think sometimes we see a lot of the big tech companies in the news a lot and they have lots of VC funding and then they have to respond, be responsible to the VCs and we all know VCs want to see like 
you know, the unicorn come out. And so there's a lot of pressure on the prophets instead of on the, the mission and the beliefs. And so I would just say for tech companies, that's something to be cautious about when you're considering building your company is just to take into account, like, what pressure does that put on you? Hi. Hi. Um, I, uh, I have a company that's just like what you're describing. Awesome. Um, it's called Radically Open Security. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> I saw you did a talk that's kind of similar earlier today. I, so I'm no, glad you're here. today. It's immediately after your talk. Oh, no way. So, okay. <laughs> so, so, sorry, sorry for the advertisement. It's, uh, <laughs> at uh, 820 in, uh, in the, big, uh, the big tent in, in PA, I'm giving a talk. It's called uh, uh, social, uh, social Enterprises as a Tool for Activism. I'm yep. going to talk about my very concrete experiences with a real company that was built on these principles. So if you guys want to hear a concrete story of uh, implementing this, uh, feel free to stop by. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. I imagine somebody will stop us whenever it's time. <laughs> yeah. Um. You mentioned, I mean, part of the discussion goes about non-profit versus for-profit, right? Yeah. Um, but even, uh, and I mean, regarding some of your questions, I would say that even if you pay, if you ha ha deliver a service, which is at cost, right? You don't yeah. have to make a profit. Exactly. But you're still charging. Now, obviously, if you run a business, you need to balance that out, and the imbalance will will at some point generate a profit if you survive, right? I mean, if it doesn't, you'll, you'll go bankrupt. If, if it survives, you'll generate a profit. Now, I think the discussion is not so much about profit or non-profit. The, the question is, what, fair, what share of profit is fair, and how do you, do you distribute the profit, right? And if you have a family company, I mean, the owners are obviously the, the beneficiary beneficiaries, if you have a, a public company, it's the stake, the, the shareholders, mm -hmm. right? And then there's a cooperative, for instance, where all the stakeholders are actually owners. Yeah, there's so all there's kinds of all structures. all kinds of things. Yeah. Right? And I think what is important for this type of business, and especially, I hope to hear that from you as well, um, there's profit and there's value, mm -hmm. right? So if you don't do a pro for profit or you want to avoid this discussion, you have probably have to do uh, a good uh, definition of value. Now the problem is that we define value in money, right? But there's other values than just money. Yeah. So, and there's not, in my knowledge, a universal system to define values that is widely uh, shared. I mean, some well, human values, but not necessarily economic values. I think, yeah, yeah, I mean, that. That would be an interesting question to try to answer. Yeah, I would answer. like to have a discussion on, 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 let's say, what do we call value when when we talk about, let's say, the road to it could be for profit or not, yeah, non profit. But what what is really value to people? Hi, uh, Hi. I, I'm. Um, uh, I thought this talk was uh, sounded really interesting. Unfortunately, I. Uh, came just now because there was another one that I really wanted to attend as well, but uh, and I didn't think that it was just going to be Q and A. But I think we have until uh, ten past eight, so there should be plenty of time to discuss. Thanks. Um, uh, <laughs> I think I, we have at least until eight. So okay. yeah. Um, uh, I don't really. I I normally always have a question, but I I think I can provide a relevant perspective. Uh, so uh, so I'm just going to. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, uh, I run a VPN service called Mulvad. Uh, I am one of the founders. I own 50% of the company. And um, 10 years ago, so I, we started in 2008, but in 2007, I realized that, does this work? Is that? Yeah. Uh, I realized that uh, in order to change the world, uh, trying to convince individual people of my idea of a better world it didn't scale well enough. So instead, I opted for uh, what I call uh, direct political action through entrepreneurship. And I... That's uh, a good term for it. Thanks. I, yeah. I, think, I think that's a good mental model because if you have 
I mean, there are so many ways to make the world better. Uh, don't get me wrong. There, I mean, starting a company is not at all the only thing you can do. But uh, the, it's very attractive if, if, you, um, if you manage to make something profitable and then scale that up over time. So now we are nine people working full time and we have two more people coming in in September. That's 11 people uh, uh, working full time. And uh, we have, uh, like both my co-founder and I, we have zero interest in uh, selling it. We've received uh, four or five serious offers of acquisition. Uh, and we just plan to do this forever. Uh, because it's fun and because uh, we believe in Because the you're right. and managing a sustainable company, yep. doing something that you believe in. Yep, and, yeah. and eventually, uh, uh, due to economics or competition or something else, it might crash and burn. But at the very least, during, no one can take, ever take away from me that during uh, a portion of my life, I funded uh, 10 full-time activists. Mm -hmm. uh, doing uh, hopefully something good, and uh, so, and that's only one way to do it. Uh, yeah. I have I have uh, friends that do it other ways. They run consulting companies, so they are senior consultants that bring in a lot of money, and then they hire people to do uh, using. A p they are, they take out smaller salaries than their consulting salaries, and they take the the excess revenue to hire people to do. Uh, all kinds of activism. So, so, um, and there are a couple of consultants that that in diverse fields, and they just pool the money so they can hire one or two developers to build uh, either an open source tool or it's uh, a product they they envision and so on. And uh, even if you don't want to do start a company or pool money as a consultant, you can still. I mean, maybe maybe you can contribute the most by simply working in the job you're doing right now, but then also donating money to EFF. That's a that's mm -hmm. fine way of, of uh, uh, contributing to, to making the world better. And I think the most wonderful thing of all is that we are by far much more, uh, ri I mean, the world is much wealthier now. I mean, we're still dirt poor. People are dying in droves every day from... Uh, very basic stuff, but we're still in a much better place. So I think that over time we can expect to to work less and less. Uh, and uh, it, you don't have to make money with all the activities you're doing. Uh, in the first two years, I didn't make any money at all. I slept. Uh, I lived in my parents' house uh, because it was fun. And uh, well, not <laughs> <laughs> not the living in my parents' house thing, but but the working on my company was fun. And and uh, doing, I have other friends that do. They work uh, ten hours a week. They don't make a lot of money, but they spend the rest of their time um, doing activism. And uh, so I think there are a lot of ways uh, that that you can one can make it change. Uh, yeah. Even if you can't make it immediately. Uh, another goal of mine was to become location independent, uh, and it took me ten years to achieve that goal. But if you just but reposition yourself over time. Eventually, you will be in a position to to uh, make a considerable contribution. Uh, I'm a complete bum, by the way. I'm I am. I mean, in terms of self-discipline and and uh, you know, willpower and all that. Uh, I, uh, but so so if I can do it, I'm confident that anyone else can. Basically, yeah. That was my rant. Thanks. Well, thanks. It's good to hear another example. <laughs> I just want, uh, I just wanted to add, like, uh, because of the question about the value and like, how do we define is it money or what? Um, I heard a talk about uh, an eco, which is the name of for the currency where people, for example, plant a tree and then they get an eco for that. Yeah. So like that could be also a model to implement, like that you provide the services for the whatever, like any kind of virtual currency, like person planting a tree or I don't know feeding uh, a homeless person or something like that like that could be also scalable that you like you don't necessarily get the money for that but you get people to do something uh, that that uh, is valuable for the others yeah hi um, <laughs> oops sorry guys um, hi uh, my name is Scott I'm, I uh, 
am one of the founders of a project. It's a, it's an activist project uh, that uses entrepreneurship, I guess, in, in some way to uh, find its way in the world. It's it's um, so it's basically a uh, booking agency for activist speakers, and our uh, whole mission is to basically make sure that our speakers don't have to get crappy day jobs. So um, most of the people that we're working with are people who have um, very specific missions in what they're doing. They, uh, a lot of them are uh, investigative journalists. Um, some people are doing kind of culture jamming projects, things that just don't really have much of a business model. And so uh, for the fa past 15 years, we've been uh, helping to bring people who are doing these kind of very obscure and, and strange things, but bring them into uh, venues where um, where they could be recognized. Everything from uh, museums to universities uh, to sometimes speaking at conferences and co and companies. Um, and while we've been doing this, uh, we've we're, we've been operating as a collective, and so that's one of our missions. Like we basically wanted to prove that you can actually have a consensus-driven uh, business. Like even though we have formal titles. You know, based in the like in the kind of like hierarchical ca capitalist kind of template, uh, that's not it. It doesn't really reflect what we all do in our in our project. Like um, we're all equals. Uh, we all and you know, it's it's no utopia. Like we we tend to fight it out a lot, um, but that's the whole thing. It's basically like the thing that's at the core of also doing like doing an ethical business is really putting in the work to communicate and that's that's like really like the whole thing because like you know we're all bringing in like all different experiences we're bringing in baggage uh, and just all these different types of things and the one thing that I found is the most crucial thing uh, that I've learned out of like running this type of like kind of social like social oriented business um, is putting in the work to perceive of other people's perspectives and having your perspectives communicated as well and to accept that sometimes we might have multiple perspectives running concurrently that might seem like they conflict with one another and to respect that in ourselves and to respect that in other people. Because I mean, between two people you might have six, six opinions about the same exact type of thing. And so it's it's um, it's worth it to actually put in the work to figure out how to weight those opinions, um, in order to actually come to a, come to a consensus. And the the other thing that's very important if you're doing a if that I've found at least if you're doing a consensus based business um, or any kind of project is to incentivize uh, incentivize cooperation. That basically, when there's a conflict, when there's a conflict that arises, which which always will, like, always build in an incentive to resolve that conflict, to resolve that conflict, and to always remain friends. Like that, the goal. Th th I guess I want to leave with this: is that the goal, um, at the, at the beginning of the meeting, even if it's going to be a contentious meeting, is to actually, um, to not leave the meeting angry. At your at your coworkers, um, and if you can, yeah. Yeah, I think that this is where it's actually an advantage to have a mission-driven company, is because if everybody agrees with the mission and is driven by something deeper and some and some personal beliefs, then um, I think aligning people on the team sometimes is easier than if you're just paying them. So I, I have a, a, a quick question. Uh, so, um, I think one problem I've seen um, in a lot of open source projects, so I used to work at a big company and I work open source academic projects, is that often there are certain skill sets which are very hard to learn and something that um, capitalist companies are very good at is scalability. Mm -hmm. Typically, you know, distributed systems kind of work, but also, you know, customer user scalability, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and that's something that seems to be a lot of open source projects, unless they're kind of lucky or quite bad at. Um, however, the problem that I've found, like many of my friends would work on free software projects, but eventually they have kids and need actual 
healthcare or money. Yeah, you need something uh, more sustainable. Then they work at Google, and you know Google pays really well, but also they learn a lot in Google. I mean, they really yeah. learn a lot about how to make things scale. But then that knowledge doesn't seem to come back ever. It seems like it gets it gets stuck. As well as anyways, we think we could do to encourage that kind of knowledge to come back and those kinds of people to come back at some point. Well, I, yeah, I think there's two things. Is one, we need to give them opportunities to be doing something similar with with here. So, um, where do they go after Google if they if all their options are is to just work for a nonprofit or to work for um, just project based like or do consulting? Then yeah, then maybe they won't be drawn back in. And so yeah, we would get more diversity and it would be a healthier place if they had similar options to Google here, we, um, I guess. Uh, and then as far as like how do we do that, I would love to hear people's ideas of like what do they need to make that transition from the open source project to some sort of sustainable organization, um, whether that be nonprofit or profit, that is there like what, what you think is holding them back to make that transition. It's all the immigration status. So Silicon Valley does enslave a lot of people on H-1B visas. Um, but it's mostly money. So it's very hard within the nonprofit sector. To it's pay. It's impossible within the academic sector to pay people uh, 100, more than 100K, 120K. That being said, that's, that's entry-level wages going on in most of these companies right now, at, at, at minimum, really. Um, and so it's, I, I, still, I actually don't know how to solve that problem. Well, I think if we if if we solve some of the problems about building sustainable businesses with good business models, and if the business model is incentivizing the right thing and staying true to your mission, then maybe instead of, maybe the the profits can be used to pay people really well and give them those competitive salaries that they couldn't get in other structures within within the space. So. Um, and how we solve that problem? I mean, we just talking about it is a good start. Like coming up with like what we need to like seed these these transitions. Like uh, what do, what's stopping people from starting companies that and are helping them to explore business models? Um, yeah. Um, sorry, can I? Uh, oh yeah. So hi, <laughs> my name is Case. It's cool to hear all these uh, stories on open source businesses. Um, I, I, maybe I add my story as well. So, my name is Case von Bokov, and I uh, am trained in computer science, bioinformatics. So I worked for two years or so as um, also as a consultant, and yeah, you can make good money. But um, what vexed me is that the open source stuff that we worked on was uh, not great quality software, and maybe partly because of that, it wasn't also used uh, in enterprises. So yeah. that's why I started the Hive five years ago you know, to become professional uh, software support for open source software and bioinformatics. And um, everyone said, of course, how, how are you going to make money? This is very difficult and it's not going to work. But yeah, it's now more than 40 people and uh, you know it's profitable, no investment. So this model seems to work. and It what, can work. What I think is encouraging is that even pharma companies and hospitals, they see the advantage of open source software. Yeah. Um, one thing I would like to bring as an extra topic um, is this book, The Master Switch, which talks about um, communication um, throughout uh, the 20th century, how everything in the end got set for centralized. So radio broadcasting ended up being one company, and you know, movies ended up being Hollywood. Um, the television is just some very big companies, and the real question is, how about the internet? Is the internet going to go the same way? Certainly, that's how it seats right now. It's just a few Silicon Valley companies. So, um, is a conf conference like this, people like this, powerful enough to make maybe a European answer in a way to say, okay, instead of um, bringing everything centrally, we're going to make decentralized business models and internets. And those can still be profitable too. So I think it's just about 8 o'clock. Is there another speaker at 8 o'clock? Are you a speaker at 8? No? Okay. Well, if you guys want to keep talking, I'm cool. <laughs>
Does anybody else have any other comments or questions? I think uh, how it started and how it ended is, uh, I, f I find it amazing because I saw a lot of questions, no? Uh, I'm, I'm right. Uh, how the conversation started? Uh, yes. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of points open and I, for myself, have to sleep about it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I would appreciate uh, if you can do a follow-up. Maybe someone else interested and will come back, even in a small round or so. Because I think with the tendencies we have at the moment on the market and also question here to internet and to decentralize it or centralize it and things like that that's rather interesting no? and uh, with the internet I came with um, for the example you have these small European filmmakers who do really good films but they do not get much money out of it no? that's kind of a parallel that came in my mind but the, the topic is quite huge and the question when I see your presentation is where to focus or where to uh, make a uh, better how to um, specify the point or the, the, what you want to work out. No? And you're pointing to tech business all the time. I think um, it's a little bit more general. It's not only in, in tech business because open source is one part which is famous in tech business, but there are other business as well mm -hmm. and uh, similar models maybe to compare them. Yeah. Uh, thanks for holding this conversation and I don't feel like there's enough of these conversations in particular for for-profit companies that are basing their work in open source technology such as yourselves and some of the others in the room yeah. um, and and I think that's a it's a 20-year challenge uh, so I you know it's 20 just, years well, we're since, gonna fix it, it this year yeah. <laughs> no but I've been I think, do, yeah, we should I, talk more about it yeah and so any any of that conversation plus one to following up 100 more times over the next 20 years to continue talking about how we can figure out what we figured out today. I just wanted to, I think one thing I, I think a lot about is in response to a comment made about, you know, trying to figure out how to streamline or make more efficient or better the business models to try to compete potentially with traditional for-profit wages. I don't think we can ever do that, at least not under the current model. I think we can pay people really well, but I think, you know, when you're, when your value add, I guess, I guess I would add an and also I think the thing that's most important is not to try to compete necessarily in monetary ways that you, you probably can't under the current like ad driven or like other markets that might go against many of your sort of ethical and value based underpinnings for a for profit. It's more of I think like figuring out a good way. There was a person who said it before. I would love to learn how to figure out what's a good way to create like a set of a, a values and mission that you traditionally see only existing in nonprofit organizations, but graphing that onto your traditional sort of for-profit structures and sort of making that the value add? Because I, I do think that there's sort of a competition for people. There's, there's, no, there's no lack of individuals who can do the really good work that a mission-driven for-profit can do. Um, but I think there is a, a, a not enough people that are sort of willing to take the plunge or the jump to go over to something that's mission driven rather than profit driven. And I, I guess I would just say anecdotally, the thing that I've seen has been convincing more people to make that jump hasn't been comparable wages. It's been a clear articulation of like what your values and vision are and understanding how working for this company is gonna advance this bigger world thing. And they are willing to forgive a lot of salary and benefits and perks if it's very clear that those values and principles and mission are sort of being well articulated and that there's a, a history demonstrated of like following that commitment. So I, I would say yes to totally figuring out how to make it better and comparable wages and make better business models, but also I think that sort of org dev and culture stuff too, because um, that's ultimately I think the sort of people we want working with us. Mm -hmm. some, some side comments. Yeah, it's 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 both. I mean, I, there is a big sell to being a mission-driven company that people can can be a part of that mission and they, they can contribute to it. Um, that said, I do think that like we, you know we had we just have to be careful not to take for granted that people are willing to give up some pay for that <laughs> because um, I do think that like t if we want to have if we want to see this become bigger, then we do need to be competitive on some fronts, um, especially when it comes to uh, people who are maybe the breadwinners in their family. They have to support other family members. They're, they're not gonna have that luxury of foregoing some salary. 
Um, and people need, uh, and so we need some with some good sustainable for-profit companies that can give them some good competitive salaries and all the benefits that they need and <laughs> sponsor their visas. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I, I can only sh I can share how we do it. So uh, uh, with so we we're not established in Silicon Valley. We have an office in Gothenburg, Sweden. So uh, we we would not be able to pay Silicon Valley salaries, but we can pay uh, market salaries for Sweden. Uh, and salaries there are already, you know, pretty high compared to. Uh, the rest of uh, then you have a Europe, competitive right, bar yeah. right there. Yeah, and, yeah. and but I would also say that uh, uh, what I I think that we we um, uh, lure people in or we convince people to join us uh, for a variety of reasons, and we basically when we have the first interview with them, we tell them that we're not interested in selling this. Uh, we want to reinvest all of our profits into just making it bigger yeah. uh, and solving more problems uh, and we also have told uh, all of our employees that if you find a metaphorical button that solves the problem and blows up the company at the same time we expect you to push the button <laughs> uh, because that is our exit strategy or whatever you would call it uh, and but furthermore I would add that uh, we also offer uh, flexibility and I think that the, uh, it's a good thing to mention. That's oh yeah. very valuable to yeah. people. Yeah, so there are, there are several of our colleagues that I don't think we would have convinced to join us if they hadn't had the opportunity to work from home uh, or set their own schedule or... Um, We're getting uh, the signal, yeah. sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be happy to talk about this more. Yeah, afterwards. but if you want to... But you're right, flexibility does... It's another yeah. value add. It's a good yeah. thing to mention. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for hanging out with more than an hour of your time. Much appreciated, and I hope that this helped you all to think about things, and I'm happy to con continue the conversation. Maybe next year we should do a panel of um, for-profit businesses to, to discuss this some more. Cool. Thanks, everyone.